So there's a, like always a line between being demanding, but there's a fine line between being collaborative and getting what needs to be done, right? So it actually became a really good exercise for me to learn to work with different people and to also observe and watch how other people work with each other. Hi there! Welcome to episode number forty of the Conductors Podcast, and Happy June! I hope that the first five months of the year of twenty twenty two have been great, if not <laughs> overwhelming or stressful or all of that. I have to admit that this spring or this first half of the year has been really, really difficult for me. I don't remember. Pre-pandemic, for the springs to be this challenging and overwhelming, to be honest, but I really found myself struggling a lot from work, from health, and from managing a lot of things. And this is probably the one week that I had the most last-minute cancellations, both from people that I was supposed to be meeting with, or from myself that I I was so. Crunched in time that I couldn't, I couldn't get down things that I thought I could finish, or I couldn't do things that I promised to do, which sucks. It's like this feeling is not great, and I'm telling you that because I was talking to a colleague just earlier this week how overwhelmed I am feeling right now or over the past few months, and she said, "Wow, I'm so glad you say that because I thought I was the only one feeling it." I said, "No, no, no." I think a lot of people actually are, and then I realized how much we don't recognize our emotions with ourselves and also with others, and it's really a great thing. Of course, we we don't want to be whining or venting all the time, but to acknowledge and give yourself time to heal, or at least to acknowledge that you're in a place of needing some rest or needing a break or Almost running out. <laughs> That's probably all the time, right? So if you haven't noticed, I'm a little unwell. I am having a really bad summer cold, which, when I was thinking about what to say for this episode, that just you know that just struck me because I realized I'm having summer cold for so many years now straight. That tells me, and so I'm a, a kind of person that I don't usually get sick. But then when I get sick, I'm very sick. You know, when my husband called flu every year, like there were some three or five years straight that he would had flu every single year, and that was always fine. Or when I when my daughter had COVID, like I was fine. But I now remember I have summer cold for so many years, and it's probably a sign from my body and my mind that. I need to slow down, and I need to rest and re- recharge from the season, which is very reasonable, right? <laughs> so, in today's episode, I'm going to share with you what I have learned professionally, personally, and everything only <laughs> this past season of you know the season of 2021 to 2022 by working three jobs. I know this is not a lot compared to some freelance musicians. But this is this is the very first time that I was on staff with three different organizations, oh, not full time but regularly. So at the beginning of the season in September 2021, I started my positions as the conductor for the Peabody Youth Orchestra, which I travel to every Saturday for the rehearsal, and I am also. Serving as the assistant conductor for the Augusta Symphony in Augusta, Georgia, which is about two and a half hour driving from where I live, and then I also am still teaching at Georgia Tech in Midtown Atlanta. And with my position at Georgia Tech, I conduct two orchestras regularly, and we have two rehearsals weekly on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and there are. Four concerts a semester between two both two orchestras, so eight concerts in a year. And then, of course, throughout the year, there were some traveling and guest conducting gigs. So, 
I thought now at the beginning of June, it's a good time to wrap up my head from my experience this season and to review what went well, what didn't went so well, and what I want to do for the coming year. So the first thing is probably the fact that I'm so unwell right now. I learned that. Okay, I always know it, but I really need to take better care of my health, both physically and mentally. And I am so ashamed to report that I'm a terrible person when it comes to exercising, you know, or regular workout. I don't. We have a Chinese saying that I'm the kind of person that if I can sit, I don't want to stand. If I can lay down, I don't want to sit. <laughs> Not to say that I'm a lazy person, but I I don't like to move around. I'm not a very active person, and I sign up for a fitness class before pandemic. It was going great, and I need something on my schedule to really get myself out of the bed, out of the house to go work out. But the studio closed because of the pandemic, and it it went out of business, and I haven't found anything to. Motivated myself since. Unfortunately, I was doing meditation a little bit since my conversation with Tiani Lu, which is an awesome interview. If you haven't heard of it, and I'll put that in the show notes when we talk about well-being and mindfulness and how that impacted her as a conductor on the podium. But when depression hit. A couple of weeks ago, and I was in a mental state that was that I was just like simply too unwell to continue meditate because I, I knew I was in my depression cycle, so that was really hard. So I am hoping to find something to motivate myself. Maybe I need a buddy. If you anyone wants to work out or do exercise or just to have a buddy to help me, like kind of have a reminder, say hey. That it's time to get out and work out. I really need to do that. <laughs> But in general, I think like I need to prioritize my health a little more, and that also that's something that I learned that I very easily put health or anything related to self care. I very often push those items down down my priority list, which is a terrible habit, and I'm so ashamed. I'm sorry. The second thing that I learned is traveling has a much more impact on my personal life and my family than I had ex- expected. I have to be honest; I don't think I'm busier than my life before pandemic. But during the two years of being home almost all the time with my family, my kids especially. Expect me to be home most of the time because we couldn't meet for ensembles for rehearsals. I was teaching online or doing online rehearsals, editing videos, and all that. So when it's time that I had to go out and actually being in rehearsal in person, and my husband was still working from home, that was a hard adjustment for them and also for me too. And I will talk about that in a second, but. To understand the emotional impact on people around me when I'm in and out so much was a hard lesson. My older daughter is now ten years old, almost eleven, so she's much more independent, and she's going to preteen, and she doesn't need me around, or she doesn't want me around that much. But my younger one, I think, really suffered, and we are seeing some behavioral changes, or like she's really struggling. Academically and emotionally and behaviorally, so we had to go through a certain treatment to accommodate that. That was something that I did not foresee or I didn't see it coming. And my conversations with a few parent conductors have really helped me. See things in different perspectives, and also to learn from others' experiences. And if you don't remember those episodes, I'll put them in the show note. But there are a few conductors that really 
openly shared their experience with me from Kristen Rauch in episode number 12. She talks about how she made a decision of being very local with her career opportunities when her kids were little. Or Susie Sider from episode number 29. She started conducting touring two weeks after she gave birth. Oh no, more maybe less than that. I think a few days. But she had kids a little later in her career, per se. That she was already established. She was getting gigs. Um, also, the upcoming two episodes you will hear next week and the following week, I'm speaking with Lydia Yampovskaya and Sarah Ivorandinas. They are all awesome parents. Just a little spoiler around <laughs> Lydia recently gave birth to her second child in the middle of, not in the middle of, but in the middle of the periods of opera conducting gigs. So she conducted the opening show. She went to give birth and then she came back for the closing show while Sarah was working in two different states with her husband being in the third state with three kids. So her family and her kids were traveling and living in three different states for more than a decade. People have different ways of coping with family and traveling and all that. But I think like the first step is always being aware, aware of how your decisions impact yourself and impact people around you. And this is still a hard lesson for me. I'm still trying to learn and to navigate it. But that's just something that kind of, that was a little surprising for me coming into this season. Now we talked about the, the health part and the traveling and the family part. Something that I learned professionally or conducting wise was about repertoire choices. So... I had spoken with an agent years ago through a workshop. You know, some of the conducting workshops started to have business skills or, yeah, business skills built into their conducting workshop programs. It's not only about conducting, but they will have people maybe looking at your resume or give you feedback on your cover letter or having a discussion with an agent. And this particular agent gave an, a piece of advice that he said you should never audition with an orchestra with a piece that you're conducting for the first time. He said it's too w- risky if you want to win the job. You should always go in with the best that you can do, which is usually not a piece that you will be conducting the first time, right? I think he has some like good reasons and some other sense for that. So, of course, you don't want to be auditioning for a good job by conducting your first Brahms one, for example. And he also went on and gave a follow-up piece of advice that he recently, by the time we were talking, started to manage one of uh, European conductors, like a rising star. And he was doing Sibelius one with every single orchestra that he was going to debut. So for that first year, he would have conducted five or more times Sibelius one. And he said, you know, this is a great repertoire when you are debuting because it's substantial enough. It's big enough. It's not so cliche classic repertoire that everybody knows or the orchestras will have very strong opinions on it, but kind of Rarely performed enough, but not so, in Chinese we say cold, but like not so unknown in a sense. And also it helps you to have a great understanding of the piece. So by the end of this first year when you're debuting, you really know how to conduct fabulous one. So those were the two pieces of advice that he gave. That kind of I stuck with me for quite a while until now. Because I don't tend to repeat repertoire. I don't think I'm that big <laughs> yet that I they I still have a lot of pieces that I haven't conducted. You know, some pieces I only conducted during my student years. I maybe conducted sections or a movement of it. I didn't conduct a full symphony. So I don't want to repeat things. I want to continue 
learning and growing, but because the Peabody position started quite late in the season, I was hired after September, so I had to program very quickly and to be able to prepare. And while I already had other commitment, so I repeated just a few smaller pieces, you know, some ten minutes or fifteen minutes pieces. What I learned was, I don't do well when I am doing the same repertoire at the same time with different ensembles. I know some people can. I've had conductor friends who would just do check for all the conducting gigs that he has for the same time, so he doesn't have to prepare different pieces. But that didn't work well for me. I did it once for one small piece. Because different ensembles are different, that's like a why. Why wouldn't them? So because I do a lot of newer music and pieces by women composers, they are less familiar for the players. So it's a little hard for me to adjust that quickly. And also because I work with student orchestras, which has a longer rehearsal cycle for each concert. For a professional orchestra, you you prepare you going for three or four or. Five, if there are generous rehearsals within a few days, usually within a week, and then you have the concert, and then you are done. But with student orchestras, it's usually between five, six weeks to ten weeks that you are kind of living with that piece, and going between different ensembles on the same piece with very different challenges really screwed me up. <laughs> I'll put it this way: I was almost great, going crazy. I felt I was at a point that I don't know anymore how I want this piece to go because they can't do. They they are doing very different things, like re- responding very differently. So what I learned is it works better for me if I finish a piece with an ensemble first, and then I start working with a different ensemble on the same piece. Now、I、have a different perspective to. About the repertoire, how to approach it, how to rehearse it, instead of like doing the same piece with just different ensembles at the same time. So that's something that I've never learned before because I never had chances to do the same rep with different ensembles in the past. But that was a like interesting finding for myself, and I thought I would share with you. And the next thing that I learned is actually something that. I've been learning since the pandemic is my people skills. Before pandemic, I didn't have to work with so many different people or different groups of people because I mostly work with the university staff, musicians, students, and in some other gigs, small gigs here and there, occasionally. But they are relatively st- consistent, so I'm working with about the same people all the time, and I get to know them. So it's a little easier. You know what to expect. You know how things will go. You know what you can get out of what. With three different organizations, three sets of staff members and artistic colleagues, and the musicians and other gigs, it was at a time not overwhelming, but like challenging for me because I'm not a very good. I'm not a person who is. Very good at admitting new people. <laughs> I am very awkward when I have to talk to strangers, and I am a very reserved person. I need to get to know people a little while before I know how to interact with them, which didn't serve me well at the very beginning of the season when I had to get to know a lot of people very quickly because season was studying. I need to get things done. I need to work with others. Thankfully, I had been working with more people during the pandemic through Girls Who Conduct, and that really helped me because I am I'm better communicating with people via text or email than actually speaking with them. I am not very good at small talks, and I'm still very nervous any time when I have to call anyone on the phone. I don't like speaking on the phone. I'm very very nervous. I think it was it comes from my first years in the United States. Like you know, like I, I had I spoke decent English, but sometimes when I'm on the phone with people with strong accents on a topic that I'm less familiar with, 
not because I was dumb, but it was an error that has never experienced in English. You know, like when you have to call customer service to get your Wi-Fi established, they were using a lot of terms that I've never heard of, where they were saying things I didn't know what they meant in that context. It always scared me. It still scares me now, but I've learned to to still get what I need to be done. So there is a like always a line between being demanding, but there is a fine line between being collaborative and getting what needs to be done. Right. So it actually became a really good exercise for me to learn to work with different people and to also observe and watch how other people work with each other. And I've learned so much by just observing my colleagues' interactions. By how they speak to each other, speaking to your bosses, or like you know, presenting a demand. Of course, everyone is different, but by listening more and being more observant in that regard, had really helped me to grow my personal, interpersonal skills and personal skills, which was also something surprising for me because I had never thought. Of that part, you know, like when you get a job, you think about oh, how you're going to manage your schedule, how you're going to learn all the repertoire, and、um, how do you get all the scores? They're expensive and all that. I tend to not think about personal issues or personal skills first, but that was like a really nice surprise that I learned this year. So that's something kind of wonderful that I wanted to share with you. And the last one is. I really learned a lot about myself, especially what I need to be successful. What kind of support, actually, I need. And I had such a great conversation with my friend Lena Gonzalez Granadas in episode number thirty-eight, when she talks about like when doing her tour in Europe at the beginning of this year, she was at home for three months, but she learned. What she needed to be successful, you know, like a certain food or a certain way of packing things, or a certain itinerary. You want to be arriving at a certain time of the day or on a certain day of the week, so you get prepared. You can go into rehearsal and start a job, like being the best you can. Those are the things that I learned about myself as well. I used to be. Very accommodating, if that's the right word for it. But I wanted to please people, because of when I'm offered a job, I want to do it well. I want to make a great impression. So I would do. I would try to say yes to whatever many things that they asked of me, no matter if they were reasonable or not. But now, when I I don't think I'm in that stage anymore with my career that I have to say yes to every single thing. To put myself out there, and also, two, I have also learned to be more protective of my integrity. If I'm put in a position when I can't thrive, when I can't be awesome, you know, for example, if I have to jump in with a too short notice with a repertoire that I is completely out of my. Specialty. I think I'm too young in conducting to have specialties, but like something that I'm less familiar with, that I'm not going to come in and do the best job I can, then I can't take it. Or if rehearsal is set in a certain way that would really stress me out, then I would ask change to change. I wouldn't have the year before, but now I understand. I need to be the best I can. And to ask all the support, like of course, if they give me or not, that's, that's another question. But I have to be very sure what I need to be successful of doing my job. Not successful in the career-wise meaning, but to do my work well, to be able to help my musicians, and I have to ask for all the support. And you'd be surprised. I am surprised. How much support people actually are willing to give you? They want you to succeed. They hire you not to have you fail, right? If you think that way, they hire you because they think you can do the job and they want you to do the job well. So, 
be not shy to ask for things that will actually help you do your job well. And also, the first step is to know what you need, to understand yourself and know how you will work the best. Is something that I've never really think about or never really analyzed for myself, and that was a surprise learn. And here we are, the five things I learned this season. They are to take care of my physical and mental health, and to understand how my traveling has impact on people around me, my family, my students, my other ensembles. It happened quite a few times because I had double or triple engagement, so I had to find sub when I'm going to gig A. I had to find a sub for. My ensemble B, and then to have my assistant cover me for gig C, it was sometimes to a point. It was like, why do do is that really the purpose of it? So to kind of really understand what that impact is, and to choose more wisely. That's what I how I'll put it. Number three, being、um, better with personal skills, interpersonal skills as well, to be able to interact with people, to have a respectful relationship with my colleagues. And I think that's tied to the lot to the next one to know how you will be successful and don't be shy to ask support and help. And one little thing about repertoire is it's really funny that I learned about myself. I'm not some people who can do the same rep with different rep, the different、uh, groups at the same time. I need to finish as a have a closure. And a restart with another group. And usually, I got much better with it because now I have a different perspective. But I can't overlap in that sense. That's just a funny thing that I've never experienced before, and I wanted to share with you. And as always, thank you so much for listening. And for the month of June, I have some awesome interviews that line up. Next week, I'll be speaking with Lydia Yampovskaya about her experience conducting both symphonic and operatic repertoire and how that is different and similar in the ways of her score preparation, her rehearsal strategies, and how that impact her career choices. And the following week, I'm be talking with conductor Sarah Yoandinas about her life traveling between three states and working multiple jobs. As music director with American orchestras, and we have a lot more interesting interviews to come. Thank you so much again, and if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast anywhere that you listen to it. And if you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, that will actually help me reach to more people. And have a great week, day, night, wherever you are. Thank you. Take care. Bye for now.